everyone, my name is Gitika Gorsi, and today I am very, very excited to be collaborating with Felix FaceTime to host an exciting panel discussion on Inspiring the Next Generation, a panel of astronauts. I'm greatly looking forward to the inspiring and insightful conversation we'll be having today with all of the panelists. So now I'll hand it over to Felix to introduce himself, his YouTube channel, as well as all of the panelists today. Thank you and um, hello everyone and welcome to Felix's Space Time. Um, so today's panel, we've got four amazing um, astronauts and future astronauts. I'll introduce you um, to them now. So first of all, we've got Nicole Stott. She's an astronaut, aquanaut, artist and mum. She's a veteran NASA astronaut with two space, two space flights and 104 days on the International Space Station and Space Shuttle. Next, we have Chris Sombrowski. He's an American data engineer, Air Force veteran and commercial astronaut. He flew to orbit on Inspiration4 on September of 2021, a private space flight funded by Jared Isaacman. Next, we have Dr. George Neald. He's the president of Commercial Space Technologies, which he founded to promote commercial space. He also serves as the chairman of the Global Spaceport Alliance. In March 2022, he flew as a private astronaut on board Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket. Next, we have, and last of all, um, we have Ron Rosano. He's a future astronaut with Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic and a space and astronomy educator. He serves on the advisory council of the Astronomical Society of the, of the Pacific and the board of advisors of the Human Space Program. That leads us on to our first question today. Um, this is for you, Nicole. Um, growing up, many children around the world dream of becoming an astronaut, but there is no one correct way of achieving this goal. What was your journey of becoming a NASA astronaut and what advice would you give to all aspri aspiring space explorers? Well, I, I like to know that people are aspiring as well. I think that's part part of the journey for sure. Um, for me, I you know I know maybe it doesn't look like it. I'd like to think so that uh, I actually had the chance to watch that first moon landing as a kid. Uh, and I think even at six or seven, you realize that's a really extraordinary thing that you're seeing happen. You know, you watch it on a black and white TV. Your parents take you outside, point at the moon, and talk about people actually. Um, being there, um, that was extraordinary. I, it wasn't the thing though, right? I have a lot of colleagues who say from that moment on, they knew they wanted to be astronauts. I just thought it was really cool. But in parallel with that, I was really thankful to have parents that shared what they loved with me. My mom, you know, if I was going to get to an art class or ballet or, you know, these kind of creative things, it was thanks to her. And also if I was going to get out to the airport where my dad was, um, it was thanks to her as well. And we as a family spent a lot of time out at the local airport. Um, my dad loved to build and fly small, you know, like biplanes to um, as a hobby. And so that was what got me off the planet for the first time. I loved it. I knew I wanted to know how to fly myself, but I think even more importantly, I knew I wanted to know how things fly. And that led me down this Man, if you want to know how airplanes fly, why would you not want to know how rocket ships fly? Space shuttle program starting up, you know, got to work at NASA. And um, long story short, as I am a rambler, uh, it, you know, that whole just love, which is what I would encourage people to keep doing. You know, people that are excited about wanting to become an astronaut or whatever it is you're wanting to do, let that curiosity really kind of fire you up because it's amazing the kind of people you'll meet that will lift you up along the way, the opportunities that'll come along if you if you pay attention to that and how happy you'll be doing that work uh, when you let that happen. And I can tell you, I am very thankful um, to have found that love of flying and wanting to know how things fly and, you know, getting to fly in space and come back to earth and share it as well. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think that's what makes me excited for commercial space is we see rockets launching every day. And it's so much more accessible for younger students to just turn on the TV, see a SpaceX launch or a Blue Origin launch, and just be inspired with all that's happening with space exploration. So it's great to hear your journey. And our next question is for Chris and George. Um, as commercial astronauts, I'm curious to learn about what did Space, going to space mean to you? And how did that experience change your perspective on the industry um, or about our planet in general? And how did that experience change your life? Well, um, I guess I'll chime in here and then George, feel free to jump in at any time. But uh, going to space was uh, uh, never really something I had dreamed that I could do. But it was something that was 
an extraordinary gift that was given to me, not just by Jared, uh, who funded the flight, but also generosity that was paid to me from my friend Kyle, who actually won the flight and then decided that he couldn't make the flight and gave it to me. So that whole experience really made me realize that going to space can be a huge act of generosity. And so that, you know, being able to share that forward and uh, pay that forward and talk to folks like you and encourage you to kind of, kind of pursue some passions is what's really important now. Um, but what did I take away from being in space? I think that's, that's huge. I mean, besides the whole part about wanting to pay it forward, uh, just being able to go through that journey of experiencing how important space is to people uh, and how exciting and inspiring it can be and encouraging people to pursue those things that they're passionate about and what they're really, uh, what they excel in so that they can propel us into the future with whatever it is that their hearts drive them towards. It, it's, a, it's a really exciting thing to see. Um, and seeing the earth from that perspective, I, I think for me, it was just an incredibly, incredibly special gift to receive. So, uh, George, what did it what did it feel like for you? What did it mean for you when you were on board New Shepherd? So great comments, Chris. Thanks. Uh, my story is a little bit different. Uh, I first became interested in airplanes and space as a child and was watching all the space flights and so forth. Uh, later on, after graduation from college, I had the opportunity to directly become involved in our, in our space programs as an Air Force officer and engineer, and then as a manager at, for NASA at the Johnson Space Center, working on the shuttle program. I was in industry for a few years, working on space taxis and reusable launch vehicles, and then uh, spent a number of years leading the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation that dealt with all the commercial companies doing these launches. So I was a part of and supporting our space programs for most of my career. And then just over a year ago, had the chance to actually participate in that myself and see what that was like. And it was an awesome experience. Uh, the whole thing was just incredible. Um, certainly the, um, the ascent, memorable, weightlessness, fun, liberating, but at least for me, the high point of the flight itself by far was the view. And looking out the huge windows and seeing the, the curvature of the earth and then that thin blue line that is the atmosphere that you're above. And when looking above that and you see the sky and it's not blue, it is the blackest black that you can imagine. And that whole image was just so beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Videos and pictures just do not do it justice. So it just became an incredible experience to have been through that. And now what I would like to do is see what we need to do to help more and more people have that experience. There's only 650 people in the whole world who have ever had the chance to go to space. So we're going to need more rockets, more spacecraft, more satellites, more spaceports, and figure out how to get the cost down and continue to improve safety so that more and more people can have that amazing experience. Amazing answers um, from both of you, um, Chris and George. Um, this next question is for you, Ron. Um, as a future commercial astronaut, how are you preparing for this life-changing experience? And what are your thoughts on the overview effect? Uh, well, thanks, Felix, and thanks for having me. Great to be with you all. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've been preparing uh, in, in a number of ways. I've, I've signed up for with Galactic in 2010 and with Blue Origin more recently. Um, so yes, uh, fitness is one. If you're if you're ten pounds lighter, you will the spaceship will go higher. So um, that's always a nice thing to focus on. Um, I've done a couple of zero g flights and uh, centrifuge training uh, at NASTAR, and I think those are are, are really helpful to so you know how your body is going to react to those conditions, and you could uh, be ready for you know everything else that that uh, is included. Um, I think what I focused on most is what I'm going to do up there. And I thought at first I just want to look at the earth. And then I read a quote from Stephen Hawking that says, oh, wait, you're going to be out in the universe. You should be thinking about what that means to you. And then I read a quote from Dave Scott, who walked on the moon in Apollo 15, and he was at an art exhibit of uh, images. 
uh, from the mission. And so when asked him, gee, Dave, you know, some people say the moon looked kind of brown. Some people said it looked kind of gray. What do you think? And Dave Scott said, you see what you expect to see. You have to open your mind. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is where I've come to now is trying to be the most open to how that experience presents itself to me. You know, it's a, it's a very quick transition from and being under the thrill of a rocket firing you at Mach 3 to having that rocket shut off and all of a sudden you're weightlessness and it's quiet and you could see the earth. So I've thought a lot about, you know, how best uh, to make that transition. And uh, regarding the overview effect, I've, I've spent a little time with Frank White, the author of the overview effect book. And um, it's not anything I think you can bring on yourself. And I think being most open gives you the opportunity to, you know, experience whatever that is. I've talked to him a little bit about um, his, uh, he's talked with a few of the people that have flown on blue and they've come away with, you know, very different experiences. Um, Chris Boshausen felt like he was drawn into the universe when he started looking out the window. William Shatner, you've probably seen, felt it was more like, oh my gosh, such a contrast of there's life down there and death up here. And he felt grief for the earth and the status of the earth. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's best to really not try and focus on any one thing. That's a, that's a great response. Uh, Ron, I was actually there when, you know, during the conference when Frank White was speaking about the overview effect and just hearing the astronaut experience. I'm very excited to so you go to space and have that opportunity to experience something very beautiful and just hearing, you know, Chris and George talking about their experiences, viewing Earth from a different perspective. It's just incredible and mind blowing. But space travel, you know, like George was mentioning, is still a very inaccessible experience. So, you know, my next question is for Nicole and George. Um, I admire all the work that the both of you do on this panel to bring the excitement around space travel to everyone here down on Earth, from students to adults and really just everyone. And so I'm curious, could you share a little bit more about some of the work you're doing down here to inspire diverse students across the world to pursue interdisciplinary aerospace careers and the importance of continuing to make space accessible for everyone? Let me go, George. <laughs> well, I want to thank I, I want to thank my three fellow panelists for um, for sharing as they have because I think um, it's really important for us to hear all of these different perspectives as well and to kind of glean the the commonness that comes from. But also, like e each one of you had this little kind of a twist on it. And Ron, I, I so look forward to you, like Gittiga just said, I so look forward to you flying in space because I think a big part of the answer you just gave about preparing to go is, um, is that understanding of what is unknown about it, right? This, um, this opportunity to open ourselves, like our hearts, our minds to what we might not be expecting to, and to be, you know, hopefully positively overwhelmed by that in some way and wanting to bring it back to earth. And I think, I think that's the big thing for me and all of what I've had the opportunity to do to, to share the experience um, coming back to earth is uh, I, I mean, it has to do with that is like encouraging people. Like I'm looking out my back window right now. I'm really fortunate to live on this canal that's off the intercoastal you know, there's beautiful flowers. My dog's laying there in the grass. There's occasionally a dolphin that comes swimming down the canal. And I'm like, that is awesome and wonderful. It is a, a lot of times it's, I feel like it's the same kind of feeling I had looking out the window of a spaceship back at earth. And it's because I think I've opened, I've opened my heart and my mind to experience those things now right? To be appreciative of them, to realize I don't, as much as I recommend it to everyone, and I, I want this accessibility to open up, I, I want people also to know you don't have to go to space to appreciate this awe and wonder, the, the, this place that we live in this universe that's so specially created for us in whatever way you believe it was created, right? You know, a little closer, a little further from the sun, not so good for us. What George mentioned about this veil thin blue line of atmosphere that seems to go on forever and yet it is veil thin and and you know chris some of the pictures you took 
from your mission are are the most incredible I've ever seen of Earth from space and the way it glows against that blackness that George mentioned. I, I, I don't think we have to go to space to appreciate that, but I want it to be accessible. So in rambling that way, as I always do, um, you know, this kind of thing that you and Felix have facilitated here, it's huge. I think you can tell that we all want to be talking about it, right? So we want to share it in as many ways as possible. You know, we take pictures, we write books, we go to the these other experiences. You know, Ron, like you mentioned, I still want to fly on zero G flights. I still want to go get in the, the centrifuge. That doesn't stop because you had the chance to go, you know, fly on a spaceship somewhere. Those are the kind, they, they just really, they're so... Um, unusual that they allow you to, I think, experience things differently. And so, um, I don't know, just being present to me is huge. I, you know, I've got this colorful spacesuit behind me. It's part of a project called Space for uh, um, Art Foundation, where we work with kids all over the world, you know, space themed art therapy stuff, just trying to you know, encourage kids to understand their role as crewmates, to lift them up, you know, in ways, most of them are in hospitals and refugee centers and orphanages, you know, you want them thinking about their future. And it's amazing how the inspiration of space, you know, every time I see your patch there, Chris, it makes me smile. And this creativity coming together can get kids thinking beyond, like really thinking about their future and the place they can have in it. And this connection between personal and planetary health and, and hopefully get them thinking about their place on a planet that's in space. And if they want how to get off it and experience earth from, you know, that vantage point as well, but there's so much going on. And I will just come back to saying in closing th this kind of thing, I mean, looking at all of your faces and hearing these different stories, I think it's such a huge way that we can be encouraging more positive things to be happening um, in the world of commercial space flight, as well as, I mean, I'm still for the NASA astronauts too, you know, going to give my hands up to them as well. But um, the, the accessibility of it all, I cannot wait to see what this is going to look like when Felix, when you and Gitika are my age, I'll, I'll, I think I'm the oldest here, you know, when what what the world and space around us will look like um, as a result of that. I, I just can't wait to see it. So great. Sorry, comment. George. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I love those comments. Just talking about all the exciting things that are going on right now, especially in the commercial space arena is just so motivating and things seem to be happening so quickly. It's almost an acceleration of of accomplishments and opportunities going forward. There's so many different projects. It's not just one company or one kind of rocket or one program. It's a wide array of things. And that is really inspiring. Uh, there's one area that I think those of us in aerospace could probably do a little bit better. And that is communicating the fact that space is not just for rocket scientists and engineers and test pilots. If you look at, at some of the visions that leadership is, is coming up with these days, for example, Jeff Bezos, who founded Blue Origin, has this vision of millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth. And of course, that'll take a long time for that to happen. But as we step along the path to, to have people living and working in space, it's going to take all kinds of different people. And yes, engineers and scientists and other experts for sure. And so if people are good at that, keep studying. You have a, a way to contribute there. But we're also going to need mechanics and electricians and welders and farmers. And also to make life more pleasant and enjoyable, poets and artists and musicians and all those kinds of people. So for those who have a passion for space, even though you may not be good at math or something else, stick with it because there's going to be a place for you. So, wow, what an exciting time to be alive today and some amazing things are going to be happening in the years ahead. Amazing. Some some wonderful answers from both of you. And thank you, um, Nicole, for those kind words about the panel. This is that's the reason that we do this is inspiring the next generation, um, kind of teaching, teaching people about kind of the opportunities and and inspiring people um, about stories. 
Um, our next question here is for um, is for Nicole. Um, um, art has been a big part of your space flights and your work on the International Space Station, and your art has inspired a lot of people, including including young people. Um, how does this make you feel, and how can everyone, including current and former astronauts, spread this kind of inspiration? Well, thanks for asking about it. I mean, I I, I don't know if you I kind of like art. <laughs> Uh, and I'm really, I mean, it, it makes me feel so good that um, by bringing together the stuff we love, right? I love art. I love space. I like science. I like, you know, and to be able to pull it all together in what I think is a meaningful way is, has been really special for me. Um, I think the biggest, the biggest thing from it, though, is what I see it doing for other people, you know, the kids in the hospitals, the just anyone who encounters one of these suits, the this idea of space and art kind of coming together. Um, I love people thinking about that. I love it from the standpoint of when I look at my son as he was going through school, I'm like, dude, I want you using your whole brain, right? Don't get channeled one way. I mean, there's things you love, but let let all of your talents come up. Let you know, use all of them. Be okay with sharing all of them. I mean, Chris shared one, you know, a little musical instrument that he played on um, on his space flight. I mean, those kinds of things. I think we as astronauts, if you will, who tend to get kind of labeled as these technical people who couldn't possibly be outside of these technical things that they do. We, we need to be actively, <laughs> proactively sharing these other loves that we have and how that all fits into who we are. And um, I've, I've made it kind of a, um, a mission in my life to share as much of that about anyone I learn about as possible. And so um, have very happily discovered that I would say at least I can probably not be... Um, overestimating, if I say at least 90% of my colleagues in the astronaut office have some creative thing they do, whether you're aware of it or not, that might be cake making or quilting or poetry or whatever it is, um, basket weaving. I'm going to throw out um, my friend, Dan Birch, who uh, I just discovered is a basket weaver and one of the most meticulously beautiful Basket, I mean, the, the, these works of art that he creates are incredible. And when I, when I discovered this, I said, Dan, did you, did you basket weave on station? He, I think it was Expedition 3 he was part of. And I was like, did you, you know, take this with you to space? He's like, yeah, but I never really told anyone. And I'm like, why? He's like, can you imagine if it got out that astronauts are in space basket weaving? What, you know, what are we paying? You know, like that kind of thing. I'm like, I think people would love it. <laughs> you know, to know that this this is going on in somebody's free time when they're not just here on Earth, but when they're in space, how we're um, taking our humanity with us. And I think we need to keep thinking about how we bring the human and human spaceflight with us, um, no matter where we go. And um, yeah, I just love it. I love the art thing. I love knowing that every single one of the people on this panel have something creative, artistic going on in their lives. And that Hopefully you're not afraid to share it. And um, I don't know if you have the video of Chris playing his ukulele on the space station, but you feel free to bring that up sometime. Oh, it's really no. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Well, I actually had no idea that there, you know, someone was basket weaving in space, but I think that is so cool. And just to see this other side of rocket scientists, I feel like ever since Especially growing up, we hear that the hardest thing, the hardest thing to study is rocket science. And yeah. to hear that these rocket scientists and engineers also have this artistic and creative side that a lot of others can relate with is very comforting to hear. And you know, another point I wanted to add to some of your comments as well, what George was saying earlier about how space is for everyone. Yeah. Growing up, you would think, I mean, I knew I thought aerospace engineer, becoming an aerospace engineer was the only space career choice available to students. I didn't realize it could be a space artist, a food scientist who works at NASA, a space physician, um, a space policy analyst. There are so many interdisciplinary careers. And I love to think of space as its like own little world. So every career, every skill set you're going to need here on Earth, we're going to need in space in the future. Yeah. And so I'm very excited within the next 10, 20 years to see how this industry will continue to grow and the new career opportunities that will continue to expand that we don't even have existing today right now. 
Um, and so, you know, leaning a little bit away from that, I had a question again for Chris and George related to commercial astronaut training. Uh, a lot of young students grow up wanting to be explorers, wanting to be astronauts. Um, and so I'm curious to learn about your experiences preparing and training to become commercial astronauts. What was that process like for the both of you? Um, and what are some activities or skills that aspiring astronauts can do to prepare for space travel? And Nicole and Ron, feel free to chime in. I think Ron kind of already mentioned some of the things <laughs> that he's doing, uh, but feel free to chime in if you have anything else to add. Well, I mean, if you can't catch the theme going on here today, it's it's really just we're going to need all kinds of people. We're going to need everyone with all their skills. And like Nicole mentioned, as we take more hum humans into space, we're going to take more of our humanity into space as well. So it's those folks, like we talk about STEAM careers and STEAM pathways constantly because it is vital. It's important. Um, and gosh, all the people I interacted with during during the lead up and the training for Inspiration4, they were all passionate about the engineering and the safety and the medical training that we were experiencing. But as you know, Ron was talking about how do you, how do you get ready for a future flight? I, I, gosh, I was, what do you do? What do you think about when it comes to what are you going to do once you get to space? Um, Nicole, thanks for saying that you thought the pictures were great. It was one of my favorite things to do was to take pictures of earth. But as I was leading up to it, we, we talked to photographers, we talked to artists, we, I took ukulele lessons that I don't know how much they helped, but you know, I, I reached out because music is a big part of not just who I am. It's, it's something that's important to my family and my extended family. And it's something lots of people can relate to. Um, and so getting in training to go to space, I gosh, I mean, it, it looks a lot different than what it did um, you know, 50 years ago, but still, um, whether you're training to go for a suborbital flight or you're training to go for uh, a stay at the station or beyond, uh, there are a lot of similarities when it comes to understanding just what the different environment is like um, and then being willing to accept new experiences and have some trust in your fellow crew members and fellow uh, trainers to, that they're going to keep you safe so that when you are put in these unique and unfamiliar scenarios that you're going to have the skills because we've been there now we've have some experience now we are still learning how to go farther out and that's what you know orion's going to do that's what we're looking at as going to mars over the next 10 plus years it's going to be an incredible time to understand what we need to do to explore and expand out but the biggest thing that we can do now and that you could do Gitika and you too Felix is that whatever it is that you find exciting is to really stick with it have that grit and determination to see it through uh, it's going to get challenging there are going to be times where it's going to be hard and just like playing the ukulele in front of my crewmates was the hardest thing I had to ever do in space uh, forget entry, forget like uh, launch. The scariest thing by far is performing in front of your friends, in my opinion. Um, and so whatever it is, just have that determination and stick with it because that is when you're going to get the results that you're trying to aim for. And if you don't get there, you've got all these other people around you that you can always ask for help. And that, that that's the other thing I would say is like, do not be afraid to ask for help because we are not doing this on our own at all, right? So just picking up on the musical theme, uh, when I was at the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston for my job, I also on the side played lead trombone in a 20 piece big band made up of other engineers and astronauts there. So yes, there seems to be a common theme of artistic and technical among many of the people on, in our profession. Uh, so just to continue the, the thought here, there's lots of ways for people to be a part of and to support our space activities in the future. So my observation would be if you can find something that you love doing that is related in some way to either current or planned activities in the future, stick with that, get good at it, try to make a difference and, and support the effort. And that's going to really pay off for the team, as well as hopefully for, for you um, in addition. Uh, one other interesting evolution that I'm seeing take place right now is, is training is really changing. 
And Nicole had to train for years to have a successful space flight on the shuttle and station. And uh, Chris certainly for months at a time to make sure that everything was going well. Now what we're seeing is that spacecraft are fully automated. Basically, when I flew on New Shepard, there was no pilot on board. There was no pilot on the ground. The computer was running the show. And some people might find that disturbing, but of course, on the bright side, there's less chance for pilot error when you didn't have a pilot. But anyway, uh, that really allows companies to streamline the training process. We only actually had three days of training that was not focused on flying the spacecraft. The computer did that. All we had to understand was how to get in and out of your seat, both in 1G and in weightlessness, how to interpret the displays and talk in the radio, and then how to respond for emergencies. And we went through time after time of simulations in the trainer on the ground. And by the time it got to launch day, we all found, felt very well prepared and very confident that we could be safe and successful on our mission. But that is a, a completely different paradigm than we've had in past years where you had to devote years of your life to prepare for that relatively short stay in space. Amazing answers um, from both of you there. Um, an interesting point about um, kind of moving away or moving to to kind of um, computers flying, you can interpret that in kind of any way, kind of you, in any way you want, kind of if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, Going on to our, our next question for Chris and, Nic uh, Chris and Nicole. Um, interacting with your crew throughout a space mission is a big part of going to space as a team and achieve um, and achieving all mission goals, like on Chris's Inspiration4 mission and Nicole's um, Space Shuttle and ISS missions. How can we convey that kind of teamwork back down here on Earth? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because going to space does involve that teamwork, right? And intentionally at the very beginning we set out to form a good strong team uh, we had come from such different backgrounds and some from very different parts of the country that we really were just four strangers who did not have a common background that a lot of times people have to get vetted through the you know at the selection process and we were still trying to figure each other out but it was um kind of going back to, to that overview effect that ron talked about is that you have to be open to it and flexible. And so how do you bring that down to earth? I think it's just being willing to be open to other ideas and to listen. Uh, if you have good listening ears and are willing to understand where people are coming from, you will understand and be better able to anticipate what their goals are and what they might do next. So. I think not just acting, but Nicole, would, would you say like a big part of it is listening to each other and understanding each other's motivations and where they're from? I'm sorry, Chris, what did you say? No, I'm sorry. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy because I think what that speaks to as well is this willingness to acknowledge that we're not all, it's not all about our strengths, right? through we have to learn like what our weaknesses are as well except that each of us have weaknesses too and that our teammates you know our crewmates might actually have strengths in those areas and how you mix all of that together to you know have mission success and stuff but man listening is one of and it's everything from you know responding to an emergency to just understanding just kind of the dynamic that's going on across the people that you're with at any given time, right? You know, understanding, okay, are we happy about the way we're moving forward with this? And, and that takes the ability to listen, which, you know, sometimes um, gets confused with not being a good leader. You know, I think the best leaders I have ever had are the ones that really and truly can listen, understand the vibe and pull it all together from, from the entire crew. And man, to me, you know, so ditto to everything you just said, Chris, and then the bringing it back to earth thing. I think the crew side of that, you know, being a good crew, understanding what being a good crewmate is being not being a passenger, but being a, a crewmate is um, one of the single greatest lessons I got from flying in space and working for NASA. You know, we go to space and we build a machine right to support our life there. And we know as crewmates that every morning we have to get up and do things like check, 
oh, how much CO2 is in my atmosphere? How much clean drinking water do I have? You know, the integrity of your thin metal hull, the health and well being of all your crewmates. And that absolutely is such a wonderful example for how we should be living like crewmates, not passengers down here, uh, you know, on spaceship earth, not a new term, you know, that that's been around for a long time. The idea of behaving like crewmates, maybe having an operating manual, not a new idea, but I think it's in all of the complexity that we do, you know, to get to space, to live there, to come home safely, not even mentioned in the science or international relationships, it really comes down to how are we going to behave together as crewmates to be successful. Um, and that's what I, I mean, if I say anything now in, um, you know, when I'm presenting to students, kids, even adults, I'm like, dudes, figure out your way to be part of the crew and to understand that that's one of the most significant roles you will ever have here on earth is to understand your role as a crewmate. And um, my friend Ron Garen and I like to say that, you know, if we if we can learn how to behave like crewmates, not passengers, we have the power to create a future for all life on Earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. And that's a pretty you know incredible thing to be a part of. And Ron, um, I cannot wait to see you. I, I because I I think the way you're preparing right now, the way you live your life is as a crewmate, right? You're that's you. the discovery is that. You know, I need to be part of this in a much bigger way. I need to understand that it's not necessarily about the 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 10 minutes of floating weightless in front of the window. It's about what leads up to that and what I do um, when I bring that experience back to earth. And so um, it's exciting to think about more and more people having that opportunity. Yeah, yeah I just absolutely. want to add, Lulu. Go ahead, Ron. You go ahead. Oh, you know, absolutely. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm th thrilled to fly, but I think just... For me, equally, I'm I'm thrilled for hundreds, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of people to be flying in, yeah. in the upcoming years, and that's I think is the huge change for commercial space and these suborbital flights is that instead of a few people flying, uh, they'll have you know many many people flying, and for all those people to come back <clears throat> with uh, you know a change in themselves and a change in their view of the world and how they relate to people. I think it's just going to lead to so many positive things uh, for the planet. Yeah, and it, Chris, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, I mean, just to add on to that, like when they when you bring that back, it, it <laughs> I know we talk in terms of crew a lot. We talk, and so that might start to get abstract for a lot of folks thinking that, well, do I really just need to train? or think about teamwork when it comes to being a part of a crew that's going to space and like, Oh my goodness, no way. That's as, re, as you're building the vehicles, as you're building the next space stations, as you're, you're building the next creative project or the next medical breakthrough. Uh, it, it's, it's, you might be highly skilled in your, in your area that you've studied, but you're not going to do anything without being a part of a team and do it as well as you could have done it without them. So keep that in mind. I, I, I jokingly say that, yeah, we might be building or engineering something that's made with electricity and design drawings and it's based in physics, but you are working with humans that are very full of cultural differences and have their own emotions and feelings that that, that can really impact your design and impact um, the outcomes. And so being a really good team member is going to affect everything that you're doing that way as well. Those are all amazing thoughts from all three of you. I mean, just the phrase both from Nicole saying, you know, be like a crew member, not a passenger. It's something very new that I've heard, but it really hit home, you know, on earth and off earth. It's so important to make sure you have that role, you play that role, and you make a conscious effort to make sure that you're part of this team instead of either taking charge or not doing anything. So finding that correct balance. And I think that's, you know, such a powerful statement. And, you know, my next question is for Ron and George, you know, commercialization, I think, excites all of us. And so with this rapidly growing commercialization in space, so many new doors are opening up, you know, with companies like Blue Origin and Axiom that are building commercial space stations that will hopefully go up after the ISS. Um, you know, the barrier of entry for going to space and conducting space research will decrease. And now a lot more individuals from scientists who are doing laboratory research right now can go to space and do their research in the future. And so I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on how do you envision the space exploration and the space industry really changing in the next 20, 30 years? And what are some technological or 
just gaps that we as an industry need to fix and solve in order to continue expanding this growing industry. Go ahead, George. Uh, yeah. It's gonna be very exciting to see all the things happening in space in the decades ahead. I, I've heard some people say, every company is a space company. Some just don't know it yet because there's such great potential, whether you're doing something in space for Earth or for the people in space or for exploration, just so many different kinds of things going on. After the International Space Station is retired, probably around 2030 or so, we're going to see multiple different commercial space stations and they won't all be the same and they'll have different purposes and different missions. Some for scientific research, some for space manufacturing, some for earth observation. We'll see orbital propellant depots and space hotels and all different kinds of activities. Uh, I think we'll see a lot more suborbital space tourism so that more and more people can have that opportunity and hope it will, hopefully it will continue to become safer and less expensive so that more people can experience that. There's something just right around the corner that I'm very interested in and excited about. And that's called uh, point to point transportation through space. Absolutely. And so I think, <laughs> although a lot of people think, oh, that's way off. I'm seeing industry develop systems that are gonna have the potential to fly from one place on earth to the opposite side of the planet in just an hour or two. Think about how that would change our life in terms of not only transportation, but how we communicate and how we do business. And whether you're talking about a business meeting or visiting friends or relatives, or just going out and sightseeing and understanding different cultures, different cities, different countries, different societies, all those things I think are gonna really help us to be able to, to shrink the planet, if you will, and hopefully get along a little better. And so those are all very exciting things. The technology is just about there. It turns out that some of our biggest challenges may be things like laws and policies and regulations. How are we gonna do that? And so there are some challenges in the non-technical world in terms of how we can use some of this new technology. But I'm pretty excited. I think we're gonna definitely see that in the next 10 years. And it's gonna open up a lot of different opportunities for people to be involved in that. Right now there's like 14 different FAA licensed spaceports in the United States. And of course, more than that around the world, but there's 20,000 airports. And if we start <laughs> thinking about, hey, we can have spaceports to go from different locations as well as to low Earth orbit and the moon and onto Mars. Wow, what an exciting time. That's perfectly said, George. It's it is a really dynamic time and you know the looking ahead five, 10 years, uh it's it's a whole new, I think, uh era of of being able to fly into space. And um one of the things I love to tell students when I'm talking to them is like what George mentioned before, is that you can be involved in the space industry in so many different ways. Yes, engineers and pilots, but there are regular office jobs, people doing legal work, managing inventory. There are trade jobs where people do like a two-year trade career after uh, after high school, and they'll be building spaceships with carbon fiber in their hands. Um, there's... Uh, jobs in hospitality that that you wouldn't think one of the most uh, uh dependent upon people at uh, spaceport is joe the barista and he makes coffee and drinks for people that are building spaceships operating spaceships people that are going to be flying to space and most anyone you talk to there said yeah yeah joe's like a key element of our organization here so I think um, that, you know, that's a great message to, to give the students is that you, you there's so many ways uh, things are opening up. It's a really exciting time. It's fun to be a part of it. Amazing answers from um, from you both as well and, and um, bringing up about like point to point transportation. That's going to be a game changer in the future. Um, Absolutely. This next question is for Ron. Um, hmm. In your upcoming in your upcoming space flight, what are you most looking forward to? And what has been your favorite thing slash activity that you've done to prepare? Oh, thanks, Felix. Um, yeah, thinking about what I'm most looking forward to, of course, you know, that moment of rocket uh, engine cutoff and the weightlessness, um, being in that space and time and, and see how it, you know, see what comes to me there. 
um, having the parachutes open and landing softly, <laughs> I think will be a really satisfying moment. And then afterwards, it's I feel like it's a transition into a new life. I mean, I can go and talk about this experience. I love uh, working with students. I've been doing classroom activities since 1995. And, you know, trying to, you know, sharing these messages that, yes, you can be involved in space. Yes, Earth exists as a planet. It's interconnected. Um, it's an extremely thin atmosphere that keeps everything alive within it. And, try, you know, sharing these messages with students, uh, I think, is, is really important. So if there are any uh, teachers or educators out there that would like to have what we call one of these space chats, um, if you search for Galactic Unite Space Chat, you could find a link to a form. And uh, we'd love to connect with classrooms all over the world and uh, have Q&A sessions with students and talk about space. Yeah, you know, this past year I had the incredible opportunity of working with Ron and like Dr. Wagner and Anita for arranging the space education symposium virtually. And I could really see Ron's passion for educating not only the youth, but also getting teachers involved in making them confident to educate students about space. When it comes to aerospace engineering or rocket science, a lot of teachers feel they don't want to talk about it, even though they're excited because they feel they don't have the technical skills to talk about it. And I feel like what Ron is doing with the Space Education Symposium and his other activities and events are really, you know, changing so many students' lives as well as teachers. So yeah. thank you, Ron. And again, so very much, excited Kika. to see you go to space. Thanks so much. And so, yeah, of course. And, you know, our, my last question for everyone on the panel, um, now that we, you know, I could see this throughout this past hour of talking with all of you, your passion for space, the future of space exploration, is so evident and it was such a fun panel. So this last question is for everyone. And it's, if you could travel back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice, whether it be regarding a pursuit of a passion, the aerospace industry, really pursuing a career in anything, if you could just give one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, and, you know, maybe Nicole, George, Chris, Ron, you know, any one of us could, you know, any one of you can start us off uh, with giving this advice. I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I think it would be um, to don't second guess yourself. Right. I think that uh, when, when people ask me what was the biggest like hurdle along the way, it was that, I mean, I doubted the heck out of myself. Um, for the longest time I thought, and you could feel, you know, it doesn't, it's not just astronaut, but I thought astronaut, oh, that's something other special people get to do. Why would they ever pick me? How could that opportunity ever open up for me? And um, I was very close to just living that line with everything, you know? And so um, very thankful to people that I considered to be mentors that I could trust to just reach out to and say, hey, this, you know, this astronaut thing, what do you think? And this was after years already of working as an engineer um, at Kennedy Space Center, learning what astronauts do, knowing that 99.9% .9 of their job is not, sadly, is not flying in space, you know, and that most of it was a lot like what I was already doing as a NASA engineer, but still I didn't it didn't give me on my own the warm fuzzy to pursue it, right? So it took reaching out to people that I consider to be mentors, which I highly encourage people to do. These are people that will know more about you than you know about yourself. <laughs> and they, they are the ones that will lift you up. And um, so thankful to them. You know, in, in particular, I have a friend named Jay Honeycutt, who is a hero of, of, um, you know, of human spaceflight. And you know, he shared things with me and with my young colleagues, like, and I still have it. I've got it right here on my little astronaut guy, you know, things like, here's how we can, not why we can't approaching things that way, believing there's a solution to every challenging problem. And I think that fits right in with not doubting yourself, with putting yourself out there and at a minimum doing the stuff that you have control of, right? And becoming a NASA astronaut, the only thing you have control of, well, I would say there might be two, you know, you need to look at what the criteria are and make sure you satisfy them. But the other one is picking up the pen and filling out the application. Because if you don't do that, it's not happening. And that was like, it was like Jay gave me permission to do that one thing I had control of that I would not have done on my own. And I, I encourage people to not, don't doubt yourself out of some of the most amazing opportunities that exist out there. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Nicole. I mean, 
shoot, let's just end the call right there. No, but I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, there are a lot of chances that you have to go and take care of things and do opportunities and, you know, un, unashamedly go after them and say, sure, I will try that. And I think being okay with messing up, being okay with making mistakes is a necessity. Uh, if you're not good at losing, you're not going to be great at winning either. So uh, that's a huge thing. And that's something that we as parents are, are still trying to teach our, our kids. And it's like, it's okay that your sister won this time. It's okay that you might win next time, but that, that's not what is fun. It's fun just being there and experiencing it. So, and then just being open to those opportunities that come along and feel free to say yes. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping my kids are having fun this weekend. We, we took a trip and we're in McMinnville, Oregon. So if you see airplanes behind me, we're at the Evergreen uh, Air and Space Museum this week, which also has an amazing water park with a 747 on top that has water slides in it. It's amazing. Okay. But anyway, just be open to the opportunities and be willing to uh, uh, try on new things. Uh, and it's like, like I said a little bit earlier, it's okay to make mistakes and it is okay to fail because that is where you are going to get your greatest lessons. So, I, I mean, I, and I mean that wholeheartedly. I've, I've screwed up a lot of things, but I've had some successes at some points that, uh, have made all the difference. So, so yeah, between what Nicole said and I'm whatever George and Ron said in just a moment too, I'm, I'm sure that's absolutely going to be something we all need to take note of. So we said this a couple of times, but there's so many opportunities right now in space related activities. If you have a passion for space, there is a place for you. So find something that you enjoy or that you're good at and try to continue to support that effort and make a difference. And if you're patiently plodding along in that direction, you might surprise yourself in terms of what you're able to experience or to achieve during your life. And let me tell you, I hope that all of you who have an interest in going space get a chance to do that someday because it is awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one of our, one of our favorite messages for students is is to, is to find something you really love doing. Be ready to work hard at, at being really good at it, and you'll never know. You know, talking to people from Virgin Galactic or, or Blue Origin, I don't think anyone that's working for the companies or that's going to fly into space would have thought 15 years ago that that's what we'd be doing now. And those opportunities are just going to come more and more often. And uh, the other thought I'd, I'd, I'd give for students is uh, to reach out to people that are interested in space and in, 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 in the kinds of things you're interested in, whether it's model rockets or, you know, designing clothes or, or something like that. Um, there's such great opportunities now online to connect to people with common interests, like for students interested in space, there's SEDS, the students for Exploration Development of Space, SDES. And Gitika, thank you for making me aware of the SGAC, the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, connect with, uh, you know, all those people of, of common interest and, and start building that network. It uh, can make a great, great difference. Amazing answers um, from all of you there, kind of talking about not giving up and just doing it and, and kind of reaching out to other people as well. Um, now that's all the questions we've kind of prepared for you today. We have got one last question that's been popped in um, our YouTube chat. Um, so I'll, I'll read that out now. So this is for anyone who who, who wants to answer. Um, how many launches has, have each of you watched in person? And what's your favorite rockets? Well, obviously I have a favorite booster. It's booster 1062, but <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> but, but I, I, Gosh, watched several launches. I was fortunate enough to see the shuttle launches um, going to college in Daytona Beach. Um, but even still, I it's my next favorite launch is going to be the one that is next. So that that's that's what I'm looking forward to. I did get to see one space shuttle launch, and Nicole, it was yours. It was STS-133 um, way back when. <laughs> way back when. Day. Stop it. <laughs> 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 um, and then, yeah, I was lucky enough to see SpaceX launch. But uh, what's been exciting, too, with Bridge Galactic and Blue Origin is, is seeing uh, their launches. I've seen three of Galactic's flights, and I was lucky enough to get to to go to uh, Blue Origin's 
fifth human flight launch back last June. So seeing the vehicles in person and seeing people uh, come off the spaceship uh, that same day, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. And it's great to have more and more people being able to do that. I did see uh, one of the uh, Apollo moon launches, um, uh, probably a dozen or so uh, space shuttle launches, which were very, very impressive. A uh, handful of Falcon 9 dragons, but my favorite's got to be the one that I saw from the inside is New Shepard, and they're all great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, the one you see from the inside. I know pe I've known people who have experienced a launch from the inside before they ever saw one from the outside. I, it, it makes, it boggles my mind that that could happen, but um, wow, that yeah. was early shuttle days when the, it was kind of a quick turn from getting selected to be an astronaut to, to flying. But um, man, George, like you, I had the, I've, you know, as a kid in Florida to see, you know, a Saturn V launch, which I don't think I, I'm looking forward to that kind of thing happening again. You know, these big rockets that can, um, you know, get us to the moon that way and beyond. Um, watched, I don't know how many space shuttle launches. And in my mind had convinced myself that I knew what it was going to feel like. Um, and yet nothing, I don't think anything prepares you for any rocket you launch on. I don't think it prepares you. And I read, I read something, George, you had done once in an uh, interview had done once where you talked about the feeling at launch, you know, the um, and how a lot of astronauts talk about getting kicked off the launch pad. Well, I'll tell you what, that's what those solid rocket boosters do to you, right? You know, when you've got inline liquid fuel, I think it's a much smoother <laughs> lift off the pad. Still, you know, just like the adrenaline and the acceleration is um, amazing. But man, that that shuttle launch, but just to watch. I'm very fortunate now to live, I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. So right across the straight state from KSC and to just be able to walk out our front door to the place my son found was the perfect viewing point to look through the houses and know that um, anything lifting off from KSC, we're gonna be able to see it from here. If it's, you know, it every single time, I don't care if it's cargo or crew, there's just this feeling about it. And um, just like wanting more and more people to have access to flying on those vehicles, I think there's something pretty impressive just about witnessing the launch of one. And the more people we could get to physically be in that place to see that happening, um, I think the better it will be as well. Because I am looking forward to that Star Trek future. I'm looking forward to those millions of people that Jeff wants on the O'Neillian habitats you know, I'm looking forward to the industry being lifted off of this planet into the benign environment of space and figuring out how to sustainably generate all the power we need from the sun and beam it back to Earth versus doing what we have to do down here to make that happen. I just think all of this that we're doing off the Earth that's about improving life for the Earth um, makes me so happy to have these conversations because I think it, it gets that word out in a way that just really needs to happen. Um, and I'm thankful to all of you for uh, the part you're playing in it too. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that was great to hear your uh, you know responses to seeing what your favorite rocket was. I hope one day I get to see a real rocket launch in person. I know for me, what got me into space was building model rockets in my tech ed classroom in middle school. So I think seeing anything blast off is very exciting. So it's great to hear that. And so I want to thank you so much um, for taking your time to do this inspiring panel. I learned so much from all of you, and it's you know such an incredible time uh, listening to your thoughts about how it was to go to space, Felix. Yeah, um, again, thank you so much, um, everyone, for, for coming on today. Um, it was amazing being able to talk to you all, had amazing answers to, to both of our questions, both of all of our, our questions. And, you know, this is what the this is what the panel is about, inspiring people, inspiring the next generation. That's that's why we do these panels. And you really helped um, kind of kind of push that today. And, and thank you so much. Well, thank you. I appreciate so much you uh, including me here. And I know Felix and Gitika, you'll be flying into space someday. Thank you. We'll see you up there. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah, thanks, you guys. It's been a great talking to you. And thanks for uh, to all the panel members. It's been fun chatting with you guys alongside uh, answering Felix's and Gitika's questions. Great discussion. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.
I hope we can do this in person. Maybe, um, Ron, you can invite us to your launch. We can all come out yeah, and celebrate together. There we <laughs> yes, go. <please. laughs> absolutely. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Thanks.